Welcome to Virtual Voices. I'm Elizabeth Pruch. I have the honor of ensuring our alumni stay engaged, um, even in this virtual world, which is why we created Virtual Voices. This is a series that just allows us to have conversations and hear from leaders and experts in certain areas. Um, we do these twice a month. One month is a broader general topic, um, and one focus a month is dedicated to a conversation about race. Today, we are very fortunate to be talking to three wonderful leaders from different perspectives, talking about how we talk to our kids about race. Um, so we'll learn more about them in just a moment, but first I wanna just remind you of a few um, Zoom reminders here. This session will be recorded. You'll have access to it later if you wanna share it or reference it later on. We suggest you stay on mute. We also suggest speaker views so you see who's speaking. If you have any issues or need help with anything, Megan Vivier, who's waving at us all, can help you from a technical perspective if you need anything at all. So please reach out and thank you so much, Megan, for making this happen for us. Um, speaking of making it happen for us, we simply could not continue to provide what we provide without our sponsors. Um, Molson Coors Beverage Company, Southwest Airlines, and TIAA are tremendous partners of ours. They care deeply about our alumni. Um, they understand the importance of engaging you all, and they understand the importance of giving opportunities to continue to learn. So thank you deeply to these three sponsors. Um, we really couldn't do this work without them. So thank you very much. Okay, now I get to introduce you to our speakers and I'm really excited about the three that we have here. Um, I'll read a quick bio and then we're gonna actually start differently than usual. We're gonna start with a video that I'll tell you about in just a moment, but allow me to first introduce you to Katia Campbell. Katia is an associate professor at Metro State University of Denver. She earned her doctoral degree from the University of Denver in the areas of rhetoric, diversity, and media studies. Her scholarship and teaching focuses on persuasion and rhetorical influence, free speech, cultural representation, popular media, and critical pedagogy. She is tremendous. And she's an artist, I just learned. If you see her background, that's all her. <laughs> so she's a Renaissance woman. So good to have you here. Um, and then we have Kevin Fox. Kevin is a social studies teacher and instructional leader at Denver School of the Arts, a traditional magnet school located in East Park Hill. I'm a Park Hill native, um, within the Denver Public Schools area. Through engaging in lifelong practice of critical self-reflection, he works to explore and develop educational approaches that disrupt the disproportionate power dynamics of systemic privilege and oppression in, in his curriculum and in his school. In addition to continuous scrutiny of traditional instructional methods and practices, Kevin also actively works with initiatives that empower student voice and leadership so that Denver's youth are well equipped to challenge systemic inequities in their communities and beyond. Um, I love that you consider the youth voice. That is so important and I commend you for all the work you're doing, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Next up is my friend, Simone D. Ross, um, a woman, many of you may already know, but Simone is an executive with over 15 years experience in enterpri enterprise expansion through strategic development, relationship cultivation, and solutions innovation. She's a catalyst for advocacy and change, serving as the founder and CEO of Simone D. Ross LLC, a consulting firm with the vision of catalyzing human thriving. Her passion is demonstrated through her work with women and youth with special emphasis on young girls. She also enjoys providing inspiring experiences, content, and presentations to ignite the light in any and everyone through her work as an MC, auctioneer, and speaker. And if you've seen her do any of those things, you'll uh, want to hire her for your next gig because she is exciting. <laughs> Simone, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. She has some of the most amazing children as well. Um, I have to throw that in there. And you'll see one of them now. So Simone recently, and you'll hear about this in just a minute, but she recently started Youth United University, um, which is an anti-racist university for kids, really teaching them about that. She'll talk more about it, but we want to introduce you. You all are the first to see this. It's a video that um, she had produced with Youth University, and we're going to hear straight from our youth's mouths about why racism is not okay. We'll watch this short video, then we'll come back and get started on the dialogue. Racism is not okay because every race deserves to be treated with equality. Racism is not okay because it's abusive and people can get hurt or held back. 
Racism is not okay because it creates violence. Racism is not okay because everyone should have equal rights. Racism is not okay because it tears people apart. Racism is not okay because it discriminates against the people of color. Racism is not okay because all people are equal and color does not matter. Racism is not okay because everyone should be equal. Racism isn't okay because it breaks down other people's self-esteem. Racism is not okay because we are different colors on the outside and we are all the same on the inside. Racism is not okay because the color of someone's skin has nothing to do with their personality. Racism is not okay because black people are not treated fairly and are accused for crimes that they didn't do. Racism is not okay because it goes against human rights. like everybody is clapping and giving you a round of applause. Um, you know, I, everything is very touching when you hear it from youth's mouth. And so that was really nice to hear. Thank you for putting that to together. Simone, I'm going to start with you. Um, we'll get into this dialogue. And for the audience, we would love to hear your questions. We got a lot submitted when you registered. So we'll make sure to try to touch on as many of those as possible. But if you have a question that comes up or if you have a burning question, please use the chat feature to ask that and I will either call on you to ask it yourself or I will um, ask it on your behalf. Um, but I want to start with you, Simone. Can you tell us about Youth United University and why you decided to start it? Uh, yeah, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for including me in this important panel. And then thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, attend and, and share in this dialogue with us. Um, so I, it's crazy. I created Youth United University within two weeks. <laughs> um, it was as soon as um, George Floyd's um, death um, was, was televised. I should, I'm not going to say death, his assassination. Um, it was right at that point. Um, the week prior to, my children and I had run 2.23 miles for Ahmaud Arbery, and um, I sat that night explaining to my son what happened. He wanted to see the footage also of his assassination, and I sat in bed with my son all night, and he wept. And my son doesn't cry. He wept all night, and he cried himself to sleep. And then about a week later, um, I had to then tell him that George Floyd was assassinated. Um, and so I, I can't have these conversations anymore with my son because these black men look like him. They look like his father. They look like his uncles, his cousins. And I, as a mother of a black son and of a black daughter, um, couldn't have these conversations any longer with him, telling him that someone else that looks like him was assassinated in broad daylight. Um, and so whenever I have conversations with people about this topic, it's, it's boiling an ocean. It's intergenerational, this thing called racism. And so I really had to stop and say, well, what's your area of genius? Because you are highly accountable to your child for doing something. I don't believe that these conversations are going to end with him anytime soon, but I really had to think, you know, like who's gonna end these conversations? And I said, well, I believe it's the kids that are gone on to college, um, but then they're going to need reinforcements, and that's my son's generation. And so I founded Youth United University to support this next generation of, of kids that can vote now and that are in college and high school, and this is, this is their reinforcements. And so Youth United University is a five-week-long summer program for kids nationwide. That's one of the many benefits of this weirdness called the pandemic. <laughs> Um, but it's nationwide, um, great kids grades six through eight, where we really have the hard conversations about race. We look at present day case studies. We talk about where race came from. It came from a scientist to justify economics of slavery. Um, so we talk about that because they don't learn that stuff in school. We discuss microaggressions, micro inequities. We teach them about advocacy. 
Um, and then we bring the family in with interactive and engaging family activities um, for them to also unpack this thing. And it's articles, it's movies, it's actually learning about the dynasty that is Africa, because oftentimes we're taught that Africa is this third world country <laughs> um, that had nothing. And so we teach them, no, there's diamonds in those hills. Um, and so that has been exciting to, to do. And, and this came from a place of accountability for me. Um, in creating the next army to dismantle this thing that has to be dismantled immediately. Simone, thank you for sharing. Um, I am just, I'm just so sorry you had to have that conversation with your kids. Um, and I am glad that you found your brilliance and created this. I think that it sounds so useful and that you focus on ensuring that those with, those youth that are able to vote um, have that vote. So thank you, Simone. Um, Kevin, I wanna, I wanna go to you next um, and ask, how, how do you engage your students about race in the classroom? You have access to students in a different way as a teacher. So tell us a little bit more about how you engage your students about race in the classroom, please. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, it's always important to acknowledge the teacher-student dynamic and the power dynamic that is inherent within that. You know, um, the first step is, in a lot of cases, internal. And that's what we're doing, especially with DPS rolling out the Black Excellence Resolution this year, which we're still learning what that looks like and how to, you know, implement and to empower our Black students to become independent and um, self, you know, uh, deciders of their own um, you know, excellence in their own trajectory. It always comes down to recognizing that the teacher is in a position of power in a system that has perpetuated racism far longer than it has dismantled it. And for most people, especially myself, um, it can take a long, long time um, before we realize that, that we're a part of that prob problem. And so the first, you know, step again is for teachers to think internally about who we are within that power dynamic. And so when you mentioned student voice and student leadership, you know, a recognition that this sort of sage on the stage, old school model of, I have the knowledge, you will absorb it from me is not only assimilative, but it's rooted in white supremacy and, and paternalism. And so kids will actually resonate th with that a lot better if you start sharing that immediately recognizing the limitations of your own understanding. And so while this is not something that I've done uh, since I've been teaching, I'm, I started my 10th year this year uh, and I've made many, many mistakes um, and I probably caused a lot of harm by not recognizing who I am in that power dynamic. I've learned that if you give students the ability to share their experiences and to explore who they are within the context of uh, systemic racism and systemic inequity, then we ultimately have uh, a really strong foundation to facilitate a really um, uh, rich conversation that's not driven by me, but it's driven by them. And that's what's so important. And so I kind of have a series of goals that I, I set for myself and for my classes. Uh, and these are written at the front of the board. And I guess right now they're, they're projected on my screen all, all the time. But, you know, um, the first step is just disrupting those power dynamics, making sure that students know that they are just as much of a teacher in this classroom as, as I am, um, and then making them feel comfortable with that um, ability to share their knowledge and their experiences. Um, it's my job to decolonize the curriculum, making sure that we're not just focusing on a singular uh, perspective that's often Eurocentric, uh, patriarchal, and you know Christian-oriented uh, and capitalistic. Um, and so exploring different curriculum, making sure that it's inclusive of different voices and different experiences is hugely important. And that's really hard to do depending on the content area. So history classes look different, of course, than civics classes from ethnic studies from geography classes. And so um, beyond that, we work to sort of dismantle those inequitable and assimilative procedures. You know, when a student is demonstrating any type of behavior that is not traditionally considered okay within the classroom, we need to ask ourselves, are we using restorative practice or are we um, using just punitive practice, and to what extent are implicit or explicit biases informing our decision as teachers and administrators. Um, and then that constant 
you know, self-awareness, right? Modeling self-awareness for students is important. For me, if I don't acknowledge that I walk with tremendous privilege every day, um, then students are going to assume that I don't know that I have it. And so as a first step, it's always important to model for them awareness of my own identity and how that relates to the systems of, of racism and inequality. But um, by doing so, we then embark on kind of a journey of how we uh, get students to be self-aware and with the ultimate goal of getting to them to have some sort of informed action. So because I know that I can be a very wordy person, I tried to really um, clearly articulate my method to try to get this to work in the classroom. And it's an ongoing process and where, you know, how effective it is, I'm still figuring out and that's okay. But um, essentially I'm dropping it into the chat. Um, you know, I wanna normalize the asset of self-identity awareness, that it's a positive thing. We wanna explore theoretical definitions of culture, which I think relates to another question that was uh, submitted. Um, and then we look at culture through multiple facets. So like deep culture, you know, shallow culture, surface culture. And then we start exploring what groups we belong to. So group membership, and then how that relates to dominant or non-dominant group behaviors. And so that power structure of being a dominant group opens up conversations around assimilation, cultural appropriation, cultural exchange, acculturation, um, and really important you know, behaviors that we see every day. And then finally working our way into critically evaluating the systems of oppression. So if we belong to a dominant group, how does that relate to our increased likelihood of being an agent of oppression as opposed to uh, you know, an ally or someone who's working to dismantle those systems? And so, you know, essentially it's a multi-step process that's not necessarily linear, but in a lot of ways, um, that's my approach within the classroom. But again, it's all centered around student self-awareness and student self-advocacy uh, and students having the ability to share their own experiences um, in a comfortable and brave way. Oh, Kevin, thank you for that detail. I think, um, you know, you hit on something also that was very important is that we acknowledge where we are and where we come from, right? Like what identities are we bringing to the table? So I appreciate that you do that. Um, I'd also love to hear from the audience on the call if you have your chat feature open, what identities are you bringing to this conversation? And, you know, why are you here? Why do you care about this conversation as well? So feel free to add that into the chat feature. Um, Katia, I'd love to move on to you, please. Um, you know, I, I find the work you do fascinating. We had a great pre-call at one point, but I, I want to ask you, when did you start talking to your own kids about race and how did you approach it? All right. So that's a great question. And again, thanks everyone for being here. This says a lot that all of us are involved in this work. Um, and thank you for putting this on. Um, what, I started talking to my kids at a, a very early age. I would say before, before the year of their ages of four. I mean, it was when they could start having conversations and when they started consuming popular media. Because what I will say is that popular media, of course, it is designated as a cultural institution and it teaches us about who we are. Um, it teaches us and gives us a framework for how we think about culture and how we engage with one another and also how we vote on policy. So it has, and, and we're so saturated with media. And when you think about it, in K through 12, um, very few students get the opportunity to really go in depth with media literacy. So I start talking to them at a very early age. A lot of times people think the talk, if you you heard that phrase before, um, happens around, for black families especially, happens around the teenage years before um, and during their teenagers driving. But the talk actually happens a lot sooner than that because unfortunately, um, I've found myself in situations throughout my, my kids, and by the way, my kids are 18 and 16 now. Um, the 16-year-old is a boy, 18-year-old is a girl. Um, but early on, they were experiencing inequities in terms of how their white identified friends could behave and the way that they could behave. What they could not get away with that their other friends could get away with. And so I see the talk as being a talk in general about, about racism. And I wanna say two other things too in response to um, Simone and Kevin. Simone mentioned intergenerational racism. That's such an important piece. And that's why I think it's important for all of us to talk to our children regardless of our race, um, because we do know that um, racism, have, it, it just continues on. And the other piece to this is that, and um, Kevin kind of touched on this a little bit, but we all have internalized racial superiority 
or internalized racial inferiority. And so when we think about that, where do we get those attitudes of because of who I am, color-wise, race-wise, I am superior or inferior? We get that from popular media. So that's why I think it's really important to um, get to our children at a young age as soon as they start consuming popular media, especially. Well, that's great. Um, gosh, and we have so many questions from the audience that are incredibly relevant to that. Um, I want to start with a different one, though, because you kind of brought it up. Um, Katie, I'll get to your question in just one second. Thank you for posing that. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned this, Katia, but what are the differences on how we talk to our kids based on our own race, our own ethnicity? What does that look like? And I think, yes. um, yeah, Katia, maybe you could start. Katia. That's, again, another great question. And um, Simone touched on it a little bit in terms of how difficult it is uh, for us for people who identify um, as a part of the BIPOC community, because when we talk about when we talk to our children or when they see what's going on, they see themselves in that. So I think that's one of the key differences. Is that um, he, here's really what it boils down to? Is that um, I will say I I believe that many Black children learn pretty quickly that things are different for them and that these racial disparities exist because of what happens in, in schools. Um, and the difference with talking to children who are um, white identified or other ethnicities that might not experience as much, um, you know, oppression or profiling is that it's not part of the everyday lived reality. So basically that key difference is talking to, is whether or not you're talking to children who do not have that as part of their reality who do not see their, their parents being followed in stores or being talked down to or, you know, or experience just the heaviness that their parents are even being, or even for them being suspended from school, they don't experience that. So it's how do we talk to our children who don't have that reality to teach them that that reality actually exists for some people versus speaking with children that actually do have that reality, but not not setting it up in a way that consumes them, that makes them feel like no matter what they do, they're never going to be able to succeed or do well or be safe in this country. So it's always, I feel like as a Black parent, it's always a balancing act. It always has been a balancing act for me. And I think what, what Katia said is super important. And so I'm approaching it from two very delicate places, right? Um, there's, as, as we've kind of been talking about, there's internalized oppression which is intergenerational and many BIPOC kids just grew up with that, right? I grew up with this list of can'ts, inclusive of my mama telling me, girl, you better not jump in that swimming pool. I just straighten your hair. Um, but that's trauma. I mean, seriously, that, that's trauma um, that we got to work through um, intercommunally. And so I work to parent to number one, break down some of that intergenerational like some of those intergenerational things. And so we've got intergenerational oppression where we all grew up with a different talk. Like you can't do this. You have to be better. You have to work harder. You have to be smarter. These are all the things you have to do within this box because then it comes down to a point of accessibility. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with this idea, like I can only access certain things because I am black, because these intergenerational talks that are rooted in oppression um, happened to me growing up. So I work to break down that intergenerational oppression within my kids, right? And to change that narrative, not with this list of cans, because I was given that, but this list of cans. Um, and I think on the other side, you are working with that, inter with that um, internalized supremacy. And so I think that for kids that are not BIPOC, you have to start certain, a certain level of call-out culture um, when it comes to, number one, understanding um, internalized supremacy, and then having a toolkit to be able to call those things out. And it starts early. It starts so early. You can watch a child in preschool. There's actually been scientific studies where they gave kids aged three years old dolls, and they said it's a, a black doll and a white doll, and they say which doll is, is pretty. Kids, even black children, pick the white doll. Mm -hmm. And so it's going back to let's break down internalized supremacy at a very, very early age. And let's talk about beauty, the true image of beauty. Let's talk about like skin color and those amazing differences. Let's talk about even those microaggressions that we'll maybe say, and maybe they'll hear mom or dad say to, to about a person of color, like, oh, he's so clean. 
That's a microaggression, right? That's a microaggression based off of a stereotype that you formulated about people of color. And so I think when having these conversations with kiddos, you got to start breaking down those internalized supremacist ideals that we've all grown up with, that we've all been acculturated to, right? Because racism is deep. I sleep in a master bedroom. Why do we call it a master bedroom? That's slave culture that has come into everything that we do in our whole way of being. And the only way to dismantle it is to get educated and to really start call out culture um, on both ends, right? Because I got to give my kids a certain level of freedom um, so that they can live and thrive and flourish and break that down. But on the other side, we got to have those courageous conversations and do the work. Mm. Mm. Kevin, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I thank you guys so much for those really great responses, especially I want to acknowledge I'm, I'm not a parent um, yet, at least. And so my, my hopes are is that I can, you know, uh, practice some of those really great insights with um, my children in the future, um, if and when I have them. But as a teacher, uh, it is also important to recognize I'm getting students right around that 13, 14 year old age, right? I work with high schoolers. And I think Simone and, and Katia have hit on a very important point is the earlier we have the conversations about what racism looks like, the more likely we are to dismantle the internalized supremacy or the internalized um, inferiorities that, that might come along with the oppression. And so the hope is that by the time students are 13, 14, you know, they're, they're still very open but they've learned a lot of behaviors from media and their parents and their com communities. And especially if you know anything about my school, Denver School of the Arts, it's, a, it's a, a white dominant environment more than just in demographic. You know, the arts, the creative and performing arts inherently are a um, Euro Eurocentric at least uh, in how they are you know, created at our school. We're a conservatory model, students have to audition to get in. And so it's a very um, assimilating and segregating process. Uh, if we want to look at how, you know, a school that is in a majority minority district like DPS, but then has a 66% white identifying population, um, we have to have conversations in a very different way in DSA than we would maybe at South High School. Um, and so the way that we have those conversations is again, sort of identifying that your identity has unique characteristics, but generally you belong to a group that historically through generations and currently has power dynamics. And so by encouraging every single student to think deeply about who they are within those systems is very important, uh, especially at the age of 13 when students are coming to their sexual identities, their gender identities, things like that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of identifying going on. And so encouraging conversations around who they are but also, again, making sure that by, by again, modeling and providing ability for self-reflection and showing that self-reflection, it should create a space where everyone is willing to, to acknowledge who they are within, you know, the classroom. And then we say, okay, what is this classroom designed as? And how are we designing processes that either make you feel more comfortable or less? And, you know, by posing those questions, using Socratic method, and again, some very, you know, intentional defining of, of what racism is. Because when we talk about internalized superiority, as Simone mentioned, you're actually, the, one of the aspects of, of being a part of the dominant group of being white is that you actually have control over what racism has been defined as. And for so many of our students in a white space, racism still comes down to that interpersonal, hateful language, calling someone a slur or you know, uh, referring to them in a way that's historically been um, canceled already. But they still are not familiar with the idea of internalized oppression. They're not familiar with the idea of institutional racism and institutional oppression. And so um, there's a great resource that I've used recently. It's called the Four Eyes of Oppression. It's been modified a couple of different times, but it's actually an exercise where we can look at how a privileged uh, group and an oppressed group that are related. So, you know, if it's patriarchal, it's men, and then it would be the women. And if it's racial, it would be white, so, you know, black identifying. And so students can work through what does ideological racism look like? What does institutional racism look like? What does interpersonal racism look like? And then what does internalized racism look like? And so these are some really important processes that, again, in a white dominant space, we have to break this very 
limited definition of racism so that they can understand that it's much more complex and it's much deeper because non-white identifying students see it and feel it every day. But if the dominant group doesn't see it, it will perpetuate. Well, and that's such a, go ahead, Simone. Oh, and I think, Kevin, you make a, a huge point also when we're talking about having conversations with your kids about racism. Racism is all about a power dynamic, right? And so oftentimes you hear the word racism being um, irresponsibly tossed around, like, that's racist. Like, the anti-maskers are like, this is racist, you're making me wear a mask. And so I think it is very important that everybody, kids and adults, understand that racism is all about a power dynamic. And so BIPOC people, by the nature of the power dynamic, cannot be racist. They can be prejudiced, but they cannot be racist because it is all about a dominant party holding power. Um, and so when I parent too, I, I know that we all, we all have prejudices, right? And so I also try to parent out the prejudices and have courageous and honest conversations about that. Um, because sometimes prejudice can be born um, from racism, right? You, you're like, all white people do this, all Latinx people do this. And so I also work really hard to make sure that within our familial call-out culture, I'm checking the prejudices that my kids may be creating. And I think that that's also important, especially for BIPOC kids, is have a conversation about those prejudices. A lot of what I'm hearing is the importance of that educating, understanding, and knowing what's going on and what you're saying and being willing to accept mistakes and learn from them and understanding. And so I think this is all good, good reasons to really think more about it. Um, Katie, you had a question that I think is really going to get to a, a question a lot of people have, especially if you have young kids. I have a almost three-year-old and almost one-year-old, so I love this question. Um, do you want to unmute Katie and ask that question? Sure, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, this is already just really fantastic. Um, I have two very young children, so I'm taking notes for future years on what the rest of you guys have said about older kids, but how do you suggest in a broader context talking about the violence done against people of color right now? Um, I'm hesitant to talk about violence in front of my children anyway, but it seems uh, important in the light of you know, the conversations that our country and our communities are having around racism. So how, how do you feel we should address that in an, an age-appropriate and a developmentally appropriate way? I was actually going to, um, I was typing up an answer to your question, but I'll, it's easier to just um, give part of an answer, is that um, for one, I always make a point to um, suggest that all children, of course, are not the same. They're not in, in, they're not in the intellectual or mature space that, you know, they're all in different spaces, so to speak. And so it really does depend, for instance, on their um, understanding of murder, on their understanding of death, on how then you can frame those conversations, especially when it talks about death. Now, if, if we're talking about race in general, um, there are a lot of great activities and you'll see a handout that Katie will, um, not Katie, I'm sorry, <laughs> that Elizabeth will send out um, after this, that I have a list of resources according, according to age on how to talk to your children about race. Um, but again, when it comes to murder, I would say, and, well, death and then murder, I would say that, um, Again, depending on the child, depending on what they are already exposed to, because I'm willing to bet that they're exposed to some type of violence already in our popular media. It's amazing how early it shows up, even in children's media. And so you can maybe use whatever they're consuming. And I'm not saying that they're consuming something that's completely violent, but if you see violent activities and maybe some of their media choices, um, you, could, you could frame it within something that they have familiarity with and talk about it in terms of that. But I would say as much as possible, try to be transparent. Of course, you wouldn't necessarily for three to five want to show images, um, but talking about how people have beliefs and they sometimes act on those beliefs that are harmful to other people to the point of taking someone's life. And, um, and I do believe that children in that age range can understand that. But again, it does depend on the child and what they are already exposed to. Thank you so much for sharing, that's super helpful. I think too, it's important to use it as an opportunity to 
kind of put your own family edict out about your beliefs. So to be able to have the conversation and say, you know, people are angry right now. Um, and there's a lot of really upset people. And so let's talk about our family beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such like fertile soil to plant those seeds and say, our family believes that equity is important. Our family believes that people, you know, should have the opportunity to, to live without fear of something really violent happening to them. And so definitely take that opportunity to just kind of create your own I'm a business person, your memorandum of understanding <laughs> within your familial, within your familial unit about what you believe and, and what you stand for. Um, so that your kids always have that lens, uh, as far as this is who I am and that, that anti-racist lens, um, because not being racist is not good enough. Um, it never was good enough, but today it's not good enough. I think it's all of our responsibility to be actively anti-racist. And that's actionable. Being like, I'm racist, that's very passive and you're contributing to the problem. You have to be actively anti-racist. And now is the time within that age group to say we are an anti-racist family. And this is what that means. Thank you so much. And there are, as Katia said, there, um, there's a list of resources that we'll be sending out afterwards. A lot of the questions from the audience also had been when registering is any good book recommendations. I want you all to know that there are a lot of those examples in there. So um, I very much look forward to sharing that with you all also. Kevin, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to add something there? Sure. And again, I, I just acknowledge that I, I have been in the high school realm for my entire education career and don't work with young, young children too much. But, you know, those, those sensitivities do continue. Um, especially, and I think there was a question that I saw about, you know, even an 11 year old or in the middle, middle school age range, you know, we're, we're really looking at just kind of making sure that the sensitivities that children have to violence, to the way that, you know, to, to death and life and illness. And you really, you know, you kind of got to know how kids feel about a lot of these these points. A lot of my students will request, you know, quote unquote trigger warnings. And while I, I tell them that I will always do my best to, you know, give you a um, sort of fair acknowledgement that the conversation is going to be difficult, my norm is that conversation should be difficult. Because if the conversation isn't difficult, then we are feeling complicit, we are feeling complacent, and that's not actionable, as Simone said. And so, you know, making sure that you're also supporting the whole child, that students have the ability or children have the ability to cope with some of those uncomfortable feelings with some really, you know, strong strategies. Um, and that is very important as well. But making sure that we, we say, why does this make us feel uncomfortable? Why, why is seeing someone murdered in this way, assassinated was a great use of the word with Simone. Why is this assassination so uncomfortable to us, right? How, how is this different than seeing something in the media? How is it similar? And then let's ask ourselves, are we so normalized to it at this point that we feel uh, desensitized? And if we do feel desensitized, let's talk about the systems that are in play that are desensitizing us and how do we resensitize ourselves around you know, the value of every person's life while also acknowledging that this is not a, you know, just a random happenstance this is not just a random incident. This is a pattern of behavior. And it comes back to that power dynamic. And I really like how Katia said, there are beliefs that drive actions. Where do those beliefs come from? And then how do we challenge those beliefs and make sure within ourselves that we aren't perpetuating them? And then how do we actively combat them when we see others acting upon or working on those beliefs as well? So again, it's very classroom oriented from my perspective, and it's also kind of 12 year old up at least, but you know, it is important to make sure that we are having those conversations with the students of that age. Well, to add really quickly, I'm sorry, this is so important, especially at young ages to start the conversations around cultural difference. Um, I think that our, when Simone was talking about anti-racism, that the, it, our, we want to be, we want to think we're all human, we're all alike, we're all part of the same family, and yes, we are. 
race is socially constructed. However, it has real material consequences in our society. And so to say that we are colorblind or that we're all human and we're all the same is actually considered a, a microaggression um, because it denies people their, their culture. And I, and I think that for a long time, that has been our tendency with our children, um, for some of us to teach colorblindness instead of valuing cultural difference and the reality of cultural difference and how we interact with one another. This is great feedback. And I love also some of what you added there about introducing different cultural differences early in early on. Um, I will quickly just say that I'm going through along with one of my colleagues, a program called Building Cultural Competency out of Cincinnati. And it's talking a lot about that. Like, what are our differences? Um, we always find similarities right away, but what are those differences that we can um, really go deeper and build better relationships off of. And that's when you really are able to build those relationships. So consider those differences and acknowledge them. Um, I want to quickly, Dan, I see your question in the chat feature. I'm going to come to you next. I want to, um, Tim, I know you're on the call. I don't know if you want to unmute and ask your question that you submitted. You may not remember it. Um, I have it if you'd like me to ask. Are you there? Are you multitasking? Okay, I'm going to ask on his behalf. Oh, he's coming back. I'll go ahead and ask. Um, you know, he says, he presented this question when he registered, but a lot of people focus on what not to say so that they're not offending others. Um, should we instead be focusing on what to say to keep the dialogue productive and going? And I think this is important for our youth as well. Um, any suggestions on how to keep that dialogue going and, and how to be cautious? And um, I know as a, as a white mother, I wanna be careful about not saying the wrong things or not showing microaggressions that I might not know are. Um, so how do we enter into those kind of dialogues, especially with our youth and, and others? I put in the chat that it's important for us to have conversations um, and continue to ask questions of our children and our young people. Because once we start to ask those questions, it's amazing what they understand and how they're perceiving the world that we might not even realize. So um, a, a quick example of that in terms of gender literacy, I, when my daughter was young, she liked Scooby-Doo. And so I just asked her, is there any character she likes um, the most? And, and how does she, does she identify? And we talked about what identifying means. And I wanted to see how she felt about, is it Daphne? And um, I can't remember the two names, but it's the stereotypical one smart woman and one woman who's beautiful and you can't have them both and blah, blah, blah. And so I wanted to see how she was processing that. And so asking those questions, I think, helps to keep that dialogue going. And but I just want to say also, Tim, I agree with you that we, we are told too much that we can't and we're getting to this space, which is dangerous, where people are afraid to talk to one another because they're afraid of being called racist or, you know, whatever it might be. They're afraid of being called out. And so we shut down and do not speak to each other. And so asking questions, I think, would be a good start. I love that, asking questions. Um, Dan, let's get to your question because this is incredibly relevant. Um, why don't you unmute, sir, and the mic is yours. Well, and I apologize for coming in late. And I feel like I missed a whole world of information that would help me. Um, but my question is around the, uh, the tough issue of the, how do you talk to kids about the police in this environment? They must, you know, they're seeing people angry at the police. They're seeing the police doing very violent things, even if they're not following closely um, the triggers to all of this or understanding the background of that, but they will see police officers in their daily lives. How do you help them think about the role of police? Who can they trust? Um, uh, and when, when should they um, be very concerned about something that they see or um, that, that goes against some of the values that we've been talking about, about violence and, and abuse and mistreatment, even if the person is in uniform. And I think the end I, of your question is so good too, Dan, because you said, and the answer is probably different based on race. Um, I'm glad that you acknowledge that. Sorry, Simone, go ahead. Yeah, I'm actually really excited to hear Katia's answer because she has a kid that's driving. And I think that's every, a boy, oh, wow. a boy that's, that's driving age. And I think that that is every mother's fear. I have a, a preteen who's wanting to go to the mall by himself and walk around. Um, and he actually has a lot of white friends. And that also is every black mother's fear. And so it's, it's, it's a duplicitous conversation, quite frankly, because who are you gonna call when you need help? You're gonna call 911. 
<laughs> and so it's having the conversation um, about, yes, these people are brought on to serve and protect. And you know what? They will. And they do it in a lot of instances. Um, then the other piece is I do a lot of education with my son about knowing his rights, knowing legally what police can and cannot do, because mm -hmm. he has got to be armed with that information. Can you be searched? What, you know, what do you do? What do you say? How do you conduct yourself? We have those conversations. Um, and then we have to have the very real conversation of what, of what we see on the news. He had the, um, the honor of meeting the exonerated Central Park Five earlier this year, back in the day where we could still commune together and hug. Mm -hmm. um, and when he met those young men, he said they were my age when they were given life prison sentences for a crime they did not commit. So it's also breaking that down from a structural and institutionalized place, um, number one, for them to understand their rights. And then it gets really, really murky when you have kids that operate with a certain amount of privilege, right? Because it's a very humanizing conversation. I mean, my kid's all over Nine News <laughs> doing raps. And so he walks this earth with a certain level of privilege. And so it's, it's a delicate balance as a mom, um, to say, you know, when you need help, these are the people you call. Be educated about your rights. Do not be naive based on the level of privilege that you live your life with, that you are exempt from any of these things. Um, understand how to conduct yourself, um, not in an oppressive way, but just in a, I'm gonna keep you alive kind of way. Um, and then giving you a resource guide of this is the people that you call. We got attorneys on deck, truly. Um, and we do that for a lot of friends in our communities because they've had such terrible interactions with police and then exposure, right? Um, because it's traumatic. It is traumatic. I, I might have been driving a little too fast one day down Brighton and the police stopped me and I had a traumatic. I'm thinking about Sandra Bland, right? And I literally look at this police officer with tears in my eyes and I'm like, I am so sorry, sir. I just want to make it home. And so it's also having that and understanding and balancing all of it and it sucks. Katia, what did you tell your 16 year old <laughs> about these routine traffic stops? You actually hit on it. You hit on it. I, it's the same thing. It's the same um, mo talking about behavior, um, exactly where to have your hands. It, when you get pulled over, it's not even an if, especially for my son who proudly wears his afro and you know stands out and and he's a black, young black male so it's where you have your hands um when you are about to reach for the registration let them know very clearly and let the officer know you are reaching for your registration that you do not have weapons in your car i mean be, being very specific and also um similarly talking about what they can and cannot do but even that's tricky because we know what they can and can't do and still we can follow everything as we've seen with all of these shootings and still uh, in, uh, have young black men and women murdered um, even when they follow all of but I agree though with giving them that legal perspective because it's important for them to know so I definitely so I did everything that sounds like we're on the same page Simone in terms of how I talk and, and then it's also just frequently reminding um, as well what strikes me is that that conversation that you two have both had to have with your children would not be the same one I would have to have with my kids, with white kids as a white parent. And I wonder just to follow that question, and I, I know we got to move to our last one, but is it in my best interest to talk to my kids about here or what your friends that are brown or black have to think about when they're pulled over? Um, is relating those kind of two things, is that a good idea, a bad idea? What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts is that it goes back to the reality uh, point that I made earlier, that we seem to be living in separate realities sometimes because of our experiences. And so I would say, yes, please, as much as you can, talk to your children for everyone, um, share what's going on. So then they don't start going with that. I mean, the other piece is that we often focus so much on the individual and the personal when it comes to, the, to racism and not the system. And mm -hmm. so it's also important to talk about the system with yeah. that and start to do it early um, with our children, especially children that are not going to um, necessarily experience it, so that when they hear others speaking up about their experiences, they are less likely to say, oh, that doesn't happen. Oh, it's just no big deal. Or it might, it's just an anomaly. It doesn't happen that often. I hear that a lot. Um, but starting early is important 
to, um, to I think, just dispel those myths that we are all on the, we, are, we all exist equally and are treated equally. Yeah. Well, I like the difference, not just talking about the, to the individual, but about the systems too. Kevin, go ahead and then we'll get to our last question. Yeah, I know I need to be brief. So I, I, what I would add in that, you know, looking at the systemic piece, there's a lot of value to talk about um, residential segregation, um, talking about generational oppression and the way that, you know, the way that housing in and of itself has been, uh, you know, sort of intermingling with the oppression of police and, you know, the intersection of the drug war. You know, there's a lot of historical evidence that you can have conversations about. There's a lot of easy resources. These are the things that your teacher should be teaching in the classroom, no matter what the class is, whether it's a, a social studies class, any type of humanities class needs to be looking at the very real, real, you know, prejudices and discrimination that's gone on, especially in housing and the way that that comes into play with the drug war. And if your, your middle or high school student is not learning about the drug war, they're not learning about redlining, they're not learning about blockbusting and you know, systemic behaviors like that, then they're not gonna fully understand the biases of, of the way that police forces have been paramilitarized. They're not gonna understand the way that politicians have leveraged fear from the quote unquote silent majority. Um, they sound pretty loud if you really listen. You know, there's, there's plenty of evidence um, to, to talk about the historical relationship between police brutality and the murders that take place and tying it all the way back to, um, you know, Fugitive Slave Acts. And so I, I guess if you wanted to push your teachers, and I would encourage you to do so, because I would ask that you push me if I were in this situation, make sure that you are pushing your teachers and your student schools to address these things and be real about it, because you can't understand police brutality and the way right supremacy works in that way without understanding these other, you know, systemic behaviors that have, you know, caused generational traumas and generational oppression. Hmm. You're so right, Kevin. Thank you for adding that. And, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up redlining selfishly because we have a virtual voices coming up about redlining. So I encourage you all to check that one out. We'll have a slide about it at the end, but it, it is so important to understand the history. Um, so pushing our teachers to, to pay attention and to educate, I think, is a wonderful bit of advice. Speaking of advice, our last question that I always love to ask our speakers, um, what tip, what advice, what one piece of guidance can you leave this leadership network with um, that, that either something we can do to help this process, um, to help talk about race with our, our kids, what one piece of advice can you leave us with? And Katia, you were already off me, so I'm going to start with oh, you. My I didn't even realize that. <laughs> Um, all right, so I would encourage further conversations, and I know you said one piece, but I would also within those conversations try not to um, try not to delve too deeply into guilt, meaning that uh, this feeling of guilt saying that my, our ancestors, well, our ancestors did this, but we didn't do it, so it's really not our fault. Um, sometimes that can be prohibitive of productive conversations. And then also to understand that change happens in increments. So sometimes we might not see the results that we want with one conversation, but we're planting that seed. And so knowing that persuasion and social change, um, even with our children, happens sometimes in increments and to be patient and be willing to engage and have those tough conversations. Mm, great advice. Simone, you're up. Um, courageously do the work because even the things that Kevin kind of challenged us all to do, those, are, those conversations don't feel good. So, so courageously be okay with not feeling good and be courageous in doing the work, whether it is talking to your schools, whether it's having these conversations with kids, whether it's reflecting on your day and how you showed up as an individual in your day and how your action or inaction has contributed to this abnormal norm that we're living in every day. Journal about it. What action could I take? What implicit bias do I personally have that impacted the decision that I made today and how I showed up and then be courageous and challenging yourself to do better the next day and unpack that stuff and unpack it with your kids. Unpack all of that. And that takes courage. Be courageous, Kevin. Yeah, and, and I just got a, um, a great question from Richard privately. And Richard, are you okay with me sharing this out loud? I wanted to check and make sure. I can see you on screen. Of course. 
Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, um, Richard was uh, was sharing um, the idea that yeah, when when you have conversations with teachers, especially in a school system that has historically again perpetuated racial inequality, uh, I, I think it is very difficult to have conversations with your teachers. Um, the first thing that I would say is you know when eighty plus percent of our teachers are white, they're going to walk with a lot of fragility. You know, I, I know that we, I've been there and I find myself feeling that at different times, you know, and I think the idea is that if you ask questions of teachers or ask questions of the schools first, you know, asking them very intentional um, things that can help you understand what's going on before starting to kind of throw a, a recommendation or an idea or even, you know, an accusation of uh, racism, it's, it's always a good idea. And I think most people try to do that in the first place, but when it's so emotionally charged, your hope is, is that your, the school systems are acknowledging the historical oppression that they've per perpetuated. You know, DPS will say it all the time, but then we have this sort of momentum of oppression. We have momentum of structure. We have momentum of culture that is really difficult to dismantle. And so I think individual teachers all think that they're in this for equality. We are all in the classroom to support each other and to support students having, you know, equal opportunity. But many, many of us don't realize that we may very well be, be a, a barrier. And so if you can engage in a conversation with your students' teachers or with your kids' teachers in a way that helps you understand first where they're coming from and what they're trying to do, you can usually work more collaboratively with them. And it is an unfair position for a student or even a parent, especially in the BIPOC community, to have to do that. And so it's very important for white families to be thinking, is my, is my child, is my student getting the anti-racism education that they need to be advocates for racial equality? Because again, we, the, in the same way that it's not appropriate for me to lean on a black you know, student in my classroom to speak from the black perspective, we should not lean on our communities who are already disenfranchised by the system to push the system to be better. It has to be, it has to be an alliance. It has to be a, an abolitionist alliance. And it comes down to, again, acknowledging that every teacher is coming in with a different, you know, uh, identity and a different understanding of what this looks like. So ask those questions and then look at the curriculum that your students are are getting. Look at the, the books they have. Look at the worksheets that they're, be, they're being given, the documents they're being given, the questions that are being asked. Because you see it all the time on social media where you see like, oh, people are recreating slave ships still. You know, simulations are really, really bad. We need to be very aware of that. And so if you can engage with your student, you see something that could be problematic or that you, that, that doesn't sit right, don't shy away. Teachers, are public servants and we are here for you to push us, but maybe approach it with some questioning first to understand it before, you know, asking them to, to do something different. That's my biggest recommendation. That is really, really good advice and incredibly powerful if we can each stand up and do that at our kids' schools and beyond. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that. I appreciate that. Um, rich conversation. It's 1201, I just want to close out by saying a deep, deep thank you to our three speakers. Um, you led us through a, a pretty remarkable conversation. You were vulnerable, you were real, you gave us some great advice and tips. I think we could keep this going for a long time, but um, I'll close just with a few reminders. We have a couple more virtual voices coming up. One about voting. We have a pretty rich lineup of speakers. I keep using that word rich, I think now, Rich, because I know you're on the phone <laughs> on the call. <laughs> Um, October 8th and then Kevin you brought it up but redlining on October 29th we hope you guys will sign up for those um, and then finally we just want to encourage you all we have Impact Denver one of our programs our six-month program um, that dives deep into issues over six months applications are open due December 4th you are our best word of mouth you're our best recruiters so please do um, pass this on and let us know if you have somebody in mind um, call my name call my is that not the song you're going after Rich but I just sang on camera. That was very embarrassing. I think that means we should wrap up. Once again, Katia, Simone, Kevin, thank you deeply for your time and your expertise. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you guys on the next Virtual Voices.